Hey, Nate, I just wanted to talk to you about some weird stuff you've been doing these past few days. Um, okay, go ahead. So two days ago, you threw up in the ball pit at a McDonald's? Yeah, I don't think that was me. That, that must have been a variant. Oh. Well, day after that, you threatened to kill the referee at your nephew's second grade basketball game because it wasn't calling three second violations. Nah, I'm pretty sure that was a variant, too. Oh. Well, then probably the, yeah, this last one. Uh, yesterday, you took a shit on the hood of my car and told me to go fuck myself. <laughs> yeah, that one was definitely me. Nate? Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and watching TV and movies. I'm your host, the Mayor Jeff Warnesick, and this is our review. I guess now we have to call it Season One, Episode Six of Loki, titled "For All Time, Always." And I am joined, as always, by the American hero Nate Thurman to review this, as we do all of our TV episodes on the Four Bro Four Squad criteria, which is the acting. The story, our favorite scene, and then theories and questions going forward, which typically in a limited series would just be overall thoughts. But uh, we kind of had our minds blown at the end of this one, knowing that there is more to the story and a second season coming to Loki. So, Nate, right off the bat, acting and cast, we now have a full, uh, I guess, first season to really evaluate. But specifically in this last episode, who stood out to you, good, bad, or indifferent? Um, I mean, there, there's an obvious contender here, um, and that's Jonathan Majors, who has been introduced in this episode, the long-awaited maybe king. They didn't really say it, but um, coming in strong with, with those vibes. Um, but he provided some great uh, – I don't know how to say it, but he provided some some great – I see just some more narcissism. You're in a room yes. with two Lokis, and he outplayed them as being a cocky bastard. Like, oh my god, I, I was just eating it up. And I don't want to Something say like, with that app too. That was just fucking. <laughs> well, he's just like right? so. I know it was great. They great gave him a prop just to be like, hey, use this. Like, like, like you're just strolling down the street on a Tuesday, and that's what he did. And like, I don't want to say like he came in, stole the show, and said, hey, you guys can take a break because. Uh, Hiddleston and uh, DiMartino had their moments in, in a lot of those scenes and they had some very touching moments, but yeah, he came in and just like, it would seem in my head cumbersome if you would think about it, like, Oh, adding another basically Loki into the, into the system because he gets into the speech where he talks about, Oh, we are all narcissists and all this stuff. But I mean, he played it well and he was very refreshing in there. I actually had read online, and this just goes to show how smart the internet is, but there were a lot of people saying that they thought it was kind of a metaphor, him having the apple and Loki and Sylvie sort of being like Adam and Eve being tempted with this Ooh, I like promise it. of like getting what they want out of life. Yeah. But I'll just say this, man. Jonathan Majors, what, again, he's credited as He Who Remains, who is another character in the comics separate from Kang. But I think for all intents and purposes, this is either a precursor to him playing Kang in the MCU or him just being deceptive and not really showing who he is. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. When I was watching him in this episode, I, it was just like someone literally putting on an acting clinic. Like if he were to show up to a class at NYU and they were to be like, <laughs> Hey, can you show these kids how to act real quick? It would be what Jonathan Majors did. Yeah. And if this is any indication going forward, he is going to have a fucking blast in this role. And I will get to it at the very end, but I think we're going to see a lot of him over the next five to six years. Yeah, he was basically taking Loki for, from some movies and maybe even early on in this series and like even embellishing on top of that. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to see him in some further MCU installments. Um, and yeah, along with Apple, they there are some people going on the internet connecting the uh, Doctor Strange where he's making the Apple mm-hmm. go away and come back. So they've got some definitely. Apple similes in there for sure. But um, yeah, he, he definitely came in and 
like I said, I don't want to say steal, stole the show, but he he made his footprint on the show. Um, and then me and Horns were actually talking off off pod. And Batha Raw kind of lost us towards the end of the series. I know. She's a very talented actress. I just feel like whenever her character in terms of Renslayer had sort of the reveal and actually had a little bit of uh, the burden to shoulder, I don't know if she was written poorly, but I was just not vibing with her scenes. I don't know what it was. I don't see her as menacing enough, and she's not cunning enough the way she's played. I couldn't on, on figure screen. out, and it's not how the plot was written or how her character was written, I don't think, but I couldn't figure out what side she was trying to play ever. And not in like a menacing, like Loki way, like he's trying to be deceptive. Like she just literally didn't know. And like she was supposed to be someone who is powerful at the top, like in the know. And now she's kind of demoralized by not knowing that. And it just wasn't played well. I don't know. It, it didn't hit me right. And I, I just found <laughs> myself not as interested in what her character was actually up to, especially once mm-hmm. Jonathan Majors was on screen. I was like, can we, can we just give him the whole fucking episode? To do yeah. This? Yeah, that's fine. The last thing I'll say briefly, I think Tom Hiddleston has done every time he's played Loki such a good job of bringing something fresh to this character and there's a lot of depth there with the way he's written but this felt like he's taken just in what loki has seen in and of his life and sort of the lessons he's learned by seeing variant versions of himself he's advanced this character's development to where he makes the ultimate sacrifice in infinity war and now we're actually seeing beyond that which chronologically doesn't really make sense but when you think about what he's seen and what he's been through after the battle of new york in this show i think it's a really fun place for us to be going forward and obviously now is a cool new challenge for him yeah he's really been able to take a step back and reevaluate himself <clears throat> and that's brought out a whole new case of emotions uh and scenarios and feelings he can go through and yeah he's definitely brought something new to this series with loki that really hadn't seen in the past and it's it's been awesome and it was kind of interesting that it took him seeing other versions of himself to realize oh god is this what i look like it's like when <laughs> oh, you hear your god. your voice on a like a recording of your own voice like oh god do i sound like that oh no let's just not talk ever <laughs> gross all right uh story and plot according to imdb the synopsis of episode six says the clock is ticking in the season finale which finds loki and sylvie on a date with destiny and nate i have this episode divided into two parts it's basically Loki and Sylvie confronting he who remains mm-hmm. and having to grapple with that decision of uh, the destiny they've always wanted or basically to rip open the universe. And then, of course, Mobius returning to the TVA to try and free his fellow enslaved variants and confronting Ravana Renslayer. So I think we would both agree definitely doesn't tie up the loose ends knowing that they have a second season coming but there was a lot to chew on here in story and plot. Maybe at sometimes too much. What did you think? Yeah, so <clears throat> we were talking a little bit about this off pod, but great episode, great series. I just didn't feel that resolution at the end that I wanted to, um, just because there's so many loose ends out there. And I understand there's a, another season coming, so super pumped, obviously. Um, but the culmination of this finale and this series i think more importantly is that the mcu is going to be changed forever going forward i may be jumping ahead because there's a lot to go through in the plot but i think that was the biggest thing i took away from this is that going forward like this changes everything for every other mcu uh uh thing going forward it's it's going to change everything everything has to kind of leapfrog off of this at this point I would maybe this is being hyperbolic and like just too in the moment, but I would say this is as big a domino to fall almost as the snap in Infinity War. I mean, this just feels like I don't think I can overstate the magnitude of what happened at the end of this episode, really. And I think recently with obviously these MCU series coming out, it's tough for a lot of people, myself included, being like there are these huge events happening in tv series or streaming series they're not in the movies and it's kind of weird but that's just the reality we're in they have the medium to do all this stuff it's really cool actually you have to watch everything i think you were saying off pod too like 
if you haven't watched Loki, like going forward, I don't know how you're going to keep up. Right. And a lot of people had started to speculate after WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier. I think Banner actually especially was was saying, I mean, for the most part, I, we like the shows a lot, but it feels like mm-hmm. we are kind of in relatively the same spot after the series as we were before. Uh, if anyone had a doubt that Kevin Feige was going to fucking swing for the fences in these shows and connect them to the movies, uh, that doubt is settled. Cause oh, this, for sure. The ending to this is like <clears throat> monumental in the MCU. Yeah. Um, so a few things in the episode um, picked up on. So Hunter uh, B-15 obviously um gets all the other hunters on it while goose chase going into where Renslayer was actually picked from, which was, mm-hmm. uh, Franklin D-, uh, D Roosevelt high school, which draws back to the pin that Mobius was kind of obsessed with 2018, um, which is also the year of the snap. So right. interesting, some connections there possibly. I don't know. We might get into that on theories and questions. I thought that was cool. I, it's weird. Hunter B 15 to me is one of the more interesting characters they like used her i think more as a plot device than anything Mm -hmm. else in the show but everything she did in this series especially after having that heart to heart with sylvie i thought was really really cool and that was case in point like once she finally bought into the bullshit that and by bought in i mean to the theory that it's all bullshit what rents yeah her she really fucked shit up in the tv and that was fun yeah, with the, starting with the heart heart with Sylvie, and then her and Renslayer, when she was caged up, had their own <clears throat> dialogue. And then this last episode where she's really turning all the hunters and all the people at the TVA onto the bullshit that the TVA is. Um, yeah, she's been used really well as like moving the plot along. Um, the stuff in what was probably Chronopolis or uh, He Who Remains Castle, mm-hmm. I'm actually going to mention in Best Scene. But before we move on to that, did you have anything else that stood out or Easter eggs, anything that you wanted to mention? Loki kissing Loki, a little uncomfortable. I was equating that to like masturbating. (laughs) (laughs) Self-love? Yeah. It's just a little self-love. And I think it is. I think we talked about this earlier. And he has come full circle, I feel like. So it it doesn't work as well. But Loki is the ultimate narcissist. Like if you told Tony Stark he could make out with himself but in 2008's Iron Man, he would have been like weird – where does the line start? Yeah. Line forms to the left with me and me and me and me. And then I'm going to cut myself. <laughs> yes. But I actually thought that like you, you could play it for jokes if you wanted to, but it was done in earnest throughout most of the series. And even if it yeah. was a little confusing, I, I liked it. I thought it worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. As much as I, I just want to throw a joke out for it, just because it does seem a little incestual, but no, the way they played it off was actually pretty meaningful and pretty touching in that moment because they have made such a connection and made both of them kind of change their mindsets and sacrifice for each other. What's, what's the line in <laughs> silence of the lambs that Buffalo Bob says when he like tucks his dick behind his legs in the mirror. He's like, would you do me? <laughs> I do I, me. I do me. It's, it's like a much uh, more heartfelt version of that. Yeah. Um, and then I'm, I'm just trying to, rack my brain here wrap my i'm still wrapping my head around what happened in this in this in this finale but um we'll probably obviously have some connections to this and theories and questions but very end loki throwing into some timeline yes and i have a a theory on that at the bottom of my notes here Uh, one thing i will say with it becoming moving on to a season two i'm excited i don't even think i would say they're kicking the can down the road because they're just expanding on these themes and concepts but Mm -hmm. I think we were all really, really hoping that maybe the final shot of the season, so I guess now we can make it of the series, would be Mobius finally getting on that jet ski. Please do some fan service and and add that in there. (laughs) If the last scene of Loki isn't Owen Wilson with sunscreen on his nose on a jet ski holding a white claw, I don't want it. (laughs) Rewrite it right now if you've already shot it. Um, now we can get another uh, whole six episodes for him to go, wow. Wow, it's got to come in. We got close a few times. Um, but oh, the one one last thing I will add on this one, um, just an interesting thing I noticed. Whenever they do get into He Who Remains Castle, there's probably a ton of shit in the background that you could look yes. at, and there's a ton of stuff that has meaning and everything. You see the 
timekeepers, the three of them. One of the statues is smashed. Now, yes, don't know exactly what that means. If that was a, another version of Kang or Kang um, that got taken down, I don't know. Um, but I'd love, love for any input on your side. I just assumed they threw a rager there two nights before and mm. some frat guy got fucked up and smashed. <laughs> No, I had a keg and threw it over there. (laughs) I do think it is metaphorical. And it's it's funny because all we've ever seen in the TVA, or at least I know I guess the version of the TVA we were shown, was the three timekeepers. Yeah. So there was a fourth one probably at one point. Like, I don't know why there would be a fourth statue and it's not an additional timekeeper. Mm hmm. So who knows? And I think the story that he who remains slash king tells them about all of his variants fighting, like basically like at first they were like, dude, we can run the universe. Then, of course, it's all narcissist psychopaths become they because of the multiverse war correct uh i don't know there's a lot to chew on there i have seen several uh like youtube videos that kind of break down the episodes and i still think there's more left uh from that setting specifically that we didn't even pick up on oh good, for sure good catch for sure All right, best scene this <clears throat> this episode to me like everything that happened in the castle it's kind of hard to differentiate like specific scenes, but was there any, maybe like a moment that stood out to you or if, even if it's just them in the castle, we make the rules. So that'll still count if you want to pick that. Um, no, this one actually happened er- pretty early on. It was the opening montage, which I actually need to go back and probably watch like three, four five more times. Um, yes. just because I know there's so many more things I can pick up on. You've got the opening montage of kind of, warping through time seeing different timelines and then the overlay of different quotes from throughout the mcu which is so great, great. so one, i one think of, i texted you guys like first 15 seconds of this episode already kick ass yes and so one of the one of the big ones was steve rogers actually saying i can do this all day and that comes from a scene where he is fighting himself mm. very parallel to loki 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 so um, that was pretty cool, um, and it's just showing all the timelines kind of being stacked on top of each other in a four-dimensional role. And one of the other cool things, and I don't know all the quotes, but I think Nelson Mandela was one of them. They used a bunch of real quotes from real life and MCU quotes, um, so it was a nice mesh. Um, like I said, I'm going to have to go back and probably just re- rewatch that first minute um, and kind of really listen and dig in because there were a ton of other ones that I I know they fucking got Tony Stark ones and all that stuff, so – the minutia put into that is just incredible. yeah, the attention so great. To yeah, I picked. I just one of the ones that I laughed at because I, um, it's just one of my favorite lines in the MCU is when at the end of the first Guardians of the Galaxy, Ronan the Accuser is ready to kill all the Guardians, and Peter Quill just goes, "Dance off, bro!" Dance off, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of killed attention, and it kind of reminds me of sort of how playful Jonathan Major's character is, like in the face of seemingly the end of the universe, like yeah. when he drops that. I don't know what it was, like a figurine on his desk. He's yeah. like, holy shit, this is fun. Now I don't know what happens after this point. Yeah, he's like, I have no idea. Let's just play. With, let's fuck around. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. I'm drunk anyway. <laughs> My favorite scene, um, it's kind of cheating. So first off, I just want to say the Loki versus Loki fight, I thought was shot incredibly well and choreographed very well. Yeah. Very good. Um, in a, in a sh- episode that didn't have much action, to be quite honest, didn't need it, really. Um it was a nice little insertion. Kate Heron made sure, like, hey, this whole thing isn't just going to be sitting and talking. We'll give you something mm-hmm. cool. But I think my favorite scene was preceding the Loki kiss that you referenced earlier. It was Loki and Sylvie's really just conversation about what to do in that moment, yeah. um, weighing the two consequences. And I think really the emotional core of this whole show and why we feel so sympathetic towards Loki is him and Sylvie both kind of have the – realization like we're loki's like we're not supposed to get what we want like yeah. we're not supposed to be happy unfortunately that's our role in the universe that's why they didn't take the devil's deal from uh miss minutes at the at the beginning exactly which was a sweet deal that was like a yeah bo jackson trade from back in the day it's like man we got to take this but they're realizing like it's just not the way that our life goes yeah. we just don't get what we want unfortunately and i thought that was really powerful and very earned as well Really yeah, just, it was a it was a nice touching, touching moment, kind of culmination of their travels throughout the universe over the past few episodes. And then, I mean, the whole 
scene, obviously, I actually saw a tweet online. It was, uh, who fucked the MCU worse? And it was Star-Lord when in Infinity War he beats Thanos across the head when they were probably going to get the gauntlet. And then it's Sylvie stabbing <clears throat> he who remains. They see ripping open the multiverse. <laughs> it's like, who made the worst decision uh, in the heat of the moment? We'll find out. We'll find out. Only time will tell. Do you have anything else? You're ready to move on to theories and questions, which I have a feeling is going to be uh, the most interesting part of the review, as is tradition. Yeah, let's move on. I'm ready. All right, first things first, uh, since Brian Boehner can't join us, um, I just had a few things that he sent me. These are more thoughts than anything. But uh, first thing he says is, I wonder how long we'll have to wait and if Owen Wilson and Hiddleston or any of the others will show up in Multiverse of Madness. I could see that film ending up like Captain America Civil War, where everyone and then some from other movie universes are in it. I have to completely agree with that. Uh, yeah, uh, which brings me to an interesting thought. I don't know if w- Owen Wilson will be in it because I think that will bring the TVA into it, which could happen. I don't know. That's Anything a- is on the board right now. Yeah, it really is. Uh, but definitely could see Loki jumping in somehow. I think Multiverse of Madness, we're going to get Deadpool. I think Hugh Jack and Oliver Prize's role as Wolverine based on that photo he tweeted on Instagram mm-hmm. the other day. And I think we'll even get a funny gag. Like, I would actually bet 10 bucks, it'd be a good payout, that Chris Evans reprises his role as the Human Torch from the 2004 Fantastic Four movie. Huh. In just, like, a brief scene. I think everything's on the table now that Marvel has all their players back. I could see Nick Cage showing up as Ghost Rider or something. Man, yeah, the, the Chris Evans thing would be pretty insane. Imagine, like, the the meta joke that they could make when he yeah. Showed. You look familiar. <laughs> you look familiar, huh? Uh, but this is how you have to bring Deadpool into the MCU, I think. Yeah, we. I mean, <clears throat> I was really gunning in Falcon Winter Soldier for Steve Rogers to come back in that, or there be a, a nod to it. I still think he is going to be live, and he may have a bigger connection to different timelines and multiverse and all that kind of stuff. So that I'll just keep on, I'll just keep on chugging down on that train and say Steve Rogers is going to show up as himself. And the other thing Banner just mentioned, he said, Loki essentially being at the TVA now, having access to temp pads really gives him carte blanche to show up anywhere and everywhere in the MCU. Yes. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that makes a that makes a very good point because <clears throat> I think of the closing scene, Mobius and, and B-15 think he's just a, I can't remember what they call him, but someone who works there. Yeah, it's just so. like, is this our new intern from Russia? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hold on. Grab grab a sandwich real quick from the from the cafeteria for me, will you? You look like you must be a senior, right? You look way older than I thought. Yeah. Who hasn't lied on a job application though? All right, let's go. Just go round robin. Theories and questions. What do you have, Nate? Um, so big question. I feel like this got overshadowed um, from a lot of other stuff. Um, where the fuck is Renslayer going? Is she going to show up again? I I would imagine. But so that's one of my questions later on. So does Renslayer, is she full of shit and she actually knows he who remains slash King? I think she is full of shit and she does know him. Well, he's well, or knew he's him, kind of dead now. We'll right. see. <laughs> because Miss Minute, but the that's the weird thing is Renslayer's conversation with Miss Minutes, where Miss Minutes knows what's going on. But. Renslayer seemingly doesn't. Maybe Miss Minutes and Renslayer are both kind of keeping their cards close to the vest and they're both lying yeah. to each other. Yeah, so now I don't know Yeah, if she's going after him at this point and going to be able to get into the castle and maybe have another confrontation with Sylvie at that point. Um, or if she's... Could you even technically temp pad in there? Because it's at the end of time. It's not like a... We haven't seen it yet. The only way people have gotten there is being pruned. Um, I know they had the conversation you can't get past the end of the timeline with the tent pad. Um, but getting there, that's a great question. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this kind of ties into that. And we spoke about it a little bit earlier, but he who remains, do you, again, I guess we just have to clarify. Do you feel like he is Kang? Is he giving them a false pseudonym? Or do you think that that is like the the Q 
King variant, the one that won out. Now that he's dead, the multiverse is ripped open. Kang, the Conqueror, exists in all of the different multiverses. Do you have a perception as how that played out? Yeah, I I think that is Kang. Um, I don't think they're going to try and spin it in any any other direction. I think it will line up fairly closely with the, with the comics. Um, and there was kind of a little insight, a little tease, whenever he was saying, people call me many things, a god, whatever they say. But he, he does throw Conqueror in there. Yes. Um, so I think that was a little nod to them actually saying, yes, he is King the Conqueror for sure. Another thing I just have to ask, and this is a big question, so I hate to throw this on you, but how do you perceive the ending? I guess it's two parts, right? It's what happens in the castle, mm-hmm. and then specifically when Loki shows up at presumably a new TVA with a statue of just, we'll just call him Jonathan Majors. <laughs> yeah, earlier I said I kind of jumped the gun because I figured this would get uh, some questions down the line. But like I said, I, I don't feel like I got the resolution I wanted. But overall, with the series and the impact, I mean, the, the finale was phenomenal. Um, it just didn't wrap up as many loose ends as I wanted, but it, it connected the whole universe. So, I mean, yeah. what more can you really ask for? I agree. Um the way that I perceived it, and again, I think I'm I'm kind of looking at this with rose-colored glasses. I'm forgiving yeah. a lot of the questions that they didn't answer by extending them out because they gave me Jonathan Majors, <laughs> yeah. which, which we wanted so badly from the start of the – once we gave up on our Mephisto theory again, like four minutes in, I think that's who we were all hoping would be the yeah big bad. I perceived – them killing, I'll just call him Kang. If if you don't think he's Kang and you want me to go fuck myself, that's fine. Uh, when they killed Kang, it ripped open all these different multiverses stacked on top of each other. And now Kang exists again in his variant forms, ruling. Basically, he was able to m- exponentially multiply his power mm-hmm. by now opening back up all of these multiverses. So now the where Loki got sent to is one of those multiverses. So now the TVA is multiplied as well. They exist in each of those multiverses has a time variance authority. And in that one, Kang is the ruler. There is no need to put up the facade of the timekeepers anymore. It's just Kang across the board. Yeah. No, I, that's very likely. I completely agree with that because <clears throat> he kind of prefaces that. He's like, okay, if you kill me, I'm going to come back in another form. Um, and you could obviously see that with the the sacred timeline branching off so many ways. Um, but yeah, that's just creating all these other new timelines, um, because there really was no sacred timeline. The sacred timeline was just that King's timeline that he said, well, this is the one I live in, so we're going to make it sacred. And this is just going to be the one timeline. So yeah, all the other timelines are just basically coming back to life. Um, now that he's not there to control anything. I look at them as like, they're all plates stacked on top of each other. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. All right, what else you got? Um, <clears throat> so going back to where Ravona actually came from 2018 as a principal or some person in, in, in education, uh, Year of the Snap, I think there's going to be a connection. I think this may be the way the TVA got some of their agents, their people that work for them, Um the whole timeline and everything, I don't know if it works out well, um, but I think it works as a great way of – a way to get a h- huge number of bodies to start working yes. um, for this agency. Um, so whether it's in the next installment, um, next movie or anything, um, but I think they are going to connect that snap back to this and show that's the way that the TV actually got some of its employees yeah, I mean, they could have grabbed her in terms of the show from any year. Yeah. So to pick 2018 specifically. Come on. I mean, there's some significance to that for sure. Mm-hmm. I That kind of ties into the other question I had. So what do you think season two will be? And I think part of this, there is a rumor on the Internet that season two is either in the can or close to being finished. Yeah. It was just kept such a secret. But I would assume that this has to, season two. Doctor Strange comes out. <laughs> Uh, March 25th of next year, so almost a full year from now. Okay. So assuming this season two comes out around that time, what could you see? And again, we have a lot of properties coming out in the interim that could affect it a lot. But 
based on what we saw here, what do you think season two will be on a high level? Like, what's the story? <sighs> on a high level, I think we may... <laughs> They may be trying to close up the other timelines now because I think it is going to cause a bunch of chaos. Um, we are going to see probably multiple kings coming back um, in their narcissistic nature and trying to reclaim their um, their throne that they never really had. Um, and then a secondary plot will obviously be Loki wants to reunite with Sylvie. So he's going to be chasing her throughout these multiple timelines that have been created now trying to get back together. Um and I'm kind of confused about where Mobius is now. He's going to yeah. have to find Mobius. His Mobius. His Mobius, exactly. I, I think season two, a great <laughs> plot device would be, and I don't, it wouldn't be cheapened at all because of what we've seen him go through, but Loki, almost out of necessity, needs to reinsert himself into the timeline, mm-hmm. whether it be to lure King out or to basically be like, guys, shit has hit the fan. And the TVA can't worry about branch timelines because the multiversal war is about to start up again yeah there's yeah you can't control this many branch timelines it would be like vacuuming your house while it's on fire it's like that <laughs> this doesn't is fine. matter this is fine <laughs> yeah this is a bigger priority all right what else you got nate uh let's see here that is about it i'm i'm more just in shock and awe more than anything what else you have all right so the last thing i wanted to close with is actually a game Ooh, let's hear it jonathan major's character we're just going to call him king for the purpose of this game because that's who he's been announced to be playing in ant-man and the wasp quantum mania and i think a lot of people assume because of how big king is in the comics thanos level arguably bigger that either king or dr doom would be the big bad of the next three phases I feel very fortunate that he was introduced this early into phase four, assuming that they do it like they did the Infinity Saga, where three phases wrap up with like an insanely huge end game level movie, which I think we're going to get again. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to read you the next 10, I guess 11, 10, sorry, 11 Marvel properties, TV and movie. And you just tell me whether you think Jonathan Majors has a chance to show up in this. So it's a yes or no. And I have my All answer. Right, let's hear it. So the first one, this is a bad one to start with, but. It's the animated series What If coming out August 11th. I say yes, even though this isn't technically MCU canon. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go with no on that one. Okay. So we got one and one. The next one is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings on September 3rd. I say no. No on this one? Hmm. I'm going to go yes on this one. Ooh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know much. I've I've briefly read up on post credit scenes we will count by the way. If you think you'll be in a post credit scene. Uh not even that. I feel like he may be a a pretty big pretty big role in this. There is when a is, when this, this comes out September 3rd. There is a portion of this that takes place in feudal Japan, showing the history of the Mandarin. So what if Kang is like someone in his army, like pretending to just like fuck shit up? Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I'll go on a limb and say he's going to show up in that one. I like it. All right. The Hawkeye series coming out in late 2021. That's all I could find on the Internet. Late 2021, Hawkeye. Mm, I'm going to pass on that one. I'll say no as well. The Eternals on November 5th. I say yes. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you on that one. I like that bet. Spider-Man No Way Home. I think this is probably the one of the biggest locks on here. I'll say yes. Mark me down for yes as well. Perfect. We have the Miss Marvel show in late 2021 i say no but i'm not that confident in that either um now i'm gonna stick with you on no on this one i don't think i don't think so yeah um all right last five moon knight starring oscar isaac and ethan hawk on disney plus spring 2022 i say no um Let me see here. 
when is this uh, 2022? This is spring of 2022. The Disney Plus shows don't have like exact release dates yet. Most of them. So about a year from now, Moon Knight. Mm, probably not. Okay, so double no. Uh, the biggest lock on the board for me, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, next March 25th. I say yes. Come on, lock it up. Right. Yeah, book it. Thor, Love and Thunder, May 6th of 22. I say yes in a post credit scene. Yes, just because of the connection with Loki, I feel like we're going to get him in there. Yeah. Uh, last two, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, July 8th of next year. I say no. I just think there's too much other important shit happening in that movie for him to show up. Yeah, you kind of, yeah, that, those were kind of my thoughts whenever you first mentioned that. I mean, I don't think there's enough room to squeeze him in. They'll be dealing with what happens to T'Challa and the throne and all that. Yes. And then the last one is The Marvels, which unites Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, and Monica Rambeau's Spectre in a movie on November 11th of 22. I say yes. Uh, yeah, he'll be showing up in that for sure. Now, if you're at home saying, where's Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania? I didn't include that again because he is literally... Confirmed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's where we got the announcement. We can mark it down as a yes if you want. <laughs> All right, so Nate, you and I think one, two, three, four, five, six of the next 11 projects, we think, not counting Ant-Man, so that'd be seven of 12. There's a good chance he shows up in that. I hope we're right. That'd be really fucking cool. Yeah, I think this is just a huge catalyst um, for any projects going forward. And that's not counting Loki season two, which, I mean, I don't see how you do that without Jonathan Majors, but... No, and the I mean, he will. Yeah, he'll show up in some form. All right, that's all I had. It's been a wild. I guess now we know it's a first season of Loki. So before we leave the people, any final thoughts or anything that we weren't able to squeeze in that you want to mention? Um, not too much. I just like I said, this huge catalyst going forward. Uh nothing's ever going to be the same again agreed and uh, i'll never eat an apple the same way again uh no <laughs> if i'm ever eating an apple around my wife get ready because i'm gonna be cocky as shit i was gonna say if you ever need to like <laughs> fire someone at work and they come in and you have an apple on your desk like fuck yeah you know what's happening i'm about to not get my severance package because watch this guy he's gonna be like warping back and forth <laughs> yeah, i will say kill me <laughs> last thing about uh Jonathan Majors again, whether he's playing he who remains, we know he's eventually going to play King. This villain as a big bad is very, I mean, Thanos was the brute force. I'm going to walk in a room, kick the shit out of you and get what I want. Yeah. This character feels much more cerebral, which I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it's going to be a nice and I think a fun change of pace for the next phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, a face value much more powerful too. Like he doesn't need the Infinity Gauntlet. Right. He just has I mean, he has his little hand thing that I don't know, little temp pad thing that he plays with, but he's very casual about it, which is even more menacing. You don't you want someone being powerful to be like well, I don't want to compare him to Hitler, but like abrasive, but like he's just get calm, but he's I controlling know. the whole universe. So which is ten times scarier that he's like exactly. not one hundred percent, yeah. Freaked out and angry. All right, for the American hero, Nate Thurmond, and the mad scientist, Brian Banner, who was forced ghost in since he couldn't be with us. I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and we are the Bro Force Squad podcast. Thank you guys for checking out all of our reviews this season of Loki. We are pumped to see what this show and the MCU has down the line. Follow us on Twitter, at Bro Force Squad. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, if you type in Bro Force Squad as three separate words, and then check out everything that we do on our website, broforcesquad.com. Till next time, Nate and I need to go have a discussion about the fate of the universe. The universe is. Uh, yeah, it's just plates stacked on top of each other. I think you said it very well earlier. But that's it. Don't overcomplicate it. Spinning plates. Sorry, spinning plates. Like that uh, guy that performs at the halftime ball at NBA games. Ba 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 da 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 ba ba da da ba da 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 ba ba da 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 da.